readers, reviewers, faithful and the fallen lovers, lend us your ears. Hello and welcome back to you for the very first time to the channel. Today we are very excited to be talking about a book. I mean, we only heard about it recently. It's called Malice. Last few months, yeah. Yeah, book one of the Faith and the Fallen by this guy called, what? Jean Gin? Jean or what? John Gwynn, that's it. He looks like a nutter, doesn't he? He, he's crazy. Beard, yeah. he just loves axes. What a weirdo. All right, we can drop the pretense. He is our own Papa Gwynn and Malice is very important to us sentimentally, but we also love it as a book and we'll we'll fight anyone who says otherwise. <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, yeah. Do you see this here? We will use it. Oh, okay. We should actually get it out, shouldn't we, Ed? We should get um, Malice out. But yes, so this is bit one of the Facebook form and today we're going to be doing a spoiler chat. So if you have not read Malice, do not watch this. Go read it Warnings. and then come back to this. Yes, exactly, because we're going to be talking about our top 10 favourite moments in this book. So if you've read this but you haven't read Valor or Inner Wrath, you can still watch this video because we won't give spoilers for yeah. those books. But we will be doing spoilers for Malice because you can't really talk about your top 10 moments and not spoil anything. Yeah, I love it on page 135 when... I'm not going to tell you what happens. It's yeah. not going to work, is it? My favourite moment is page 437. <laughs> that page is crazy. That would not be a good video. <laughs> but let's get into it. Let's get down to business. So I imagine if works. you're still here, you're ready to get into the top 10 moments. Yeah, top 10. Malice. Please let us know what your top 10 moments are and if we missed any that you absolutely love. We will do a few honourable mentions as well. You know us, we like to bend the rules that we made. Um, but yeah, please let us know in the comments below. Number 10 is when Corban sneaks into Brina's cottage. So good, such a good moment where Corbin is being bullied by Rafe, that's a terrible man. And uh, so there's somehow a kind of a challenge arises and Corbin says that he will sneak into Brina's and steal something to prove that he's gone into there. Mm -hmm. And they're all terrified of Brina. And he sneaks in, he gets a comb, and then suddenly he hears Steeler. Yeah. Steeler, and he's like, what is that? And it's a crow talking to him, it's Kraft. Yeah. Kraft is one of the greatest characters of the Faith and the Fallen. And you, you first meet him here, and Brina as well, we come to love her. And she's met properly in this scene as well. I think there's a glimpse of her of some warriors being terrified of her uh, at the wedding feast of um, Marek. And yeah, here we meet her properly. And it's just an awesome moment where we see how petrified Corbin is and how Brina's uh, seen a chance where she can, uh, she can uh, make a deal with him, a bargain. Mm. And I see Brina as Dame Judi Dench, that actress. Uh, and uh, you know, the way that Brina, her tongue is sharper than anyone else's sword. Uh, it, she's a fantastic character. Kraft is a, such a funny character as well. You can really feel the fear that Corban and you know Cohen and all the other characters around there um, that have at the thought of Corban going into her cottage. But he, Brina, you see her kindness where she gives Corban the bone comb um, to prove that you know so Corban can prove to the nasty Wraith um, that he went into the cottage. And then they are, after that, Corban has a journey where he's kind of getting to know Brina. He does chores around her house whilst Kraft mocks him throughout the day. But yeah, absolutely love that scene. Brina is a fantastic character and we all love watching her and Kraft. Number nine then is, it's not, really, it's not really a happy moment really. <laughs> there are happy moments. No, it's more of a, a good scene, which is Castell's da death. So it's, uh, it's in the Catacombs of Haldus, which is an ancient giant fortress, a stronghold, uh, and Caladus and the Alliance there are trying to push through and destroy the remnants of the Hunan. Uh, and it's there the, when things start to just go terribly, really terribly, don't they? Well, you know something's about to happen. There's a bit going to be something terrible that happens, but you're not quite sure what. You're feeling this tension, this kind of suspense, this feeling of dread. And then a client just lops off Romar's head and then there's just utter chaos. And then it, Jail falls into Castell and they have a little little chat in the middle mm -hmm. of the of the battle. And Castell, even though him and Jail have had their differences to say this, he doesn't expect what's about to happen next and Jail stabs him brutally from just terrible terrible way. It's just made me so emotional that when I read that scene and obviously you can you're gonna feel Macquin's heartache as well. And you know what happened to those characters in those catacombs. It's an amazing, amazing sequence. Uh, and I absolutely love the way that Papa Gwyn, you know, he unfolds there. You have a feeling, the tension is high, you know something bad is gonna happen, but you don't know what. And you definitely don't feel that a POV character is gonna be butcherly, well, massacred really. Yeah, basically. Um, killed. 
But there it happens. Number eight then is when Corban finally duels Rafe oh, at yes. the end, and this is in the feast hall uh, of Dun Carrig. Yeah, and it's not just about the duel of kind of this kind of enmity coming to kind of a, a huge kind of resolution mm. in Malice. It's also you know that it's going to be about the fate of Storm. Is she going to be chucked out? There's a lot on the line. There is a lot on the line, and then Corbin, you're like, is he good enough to fight uh, Rafe? Rafe is two, three years older than him, trained a lot longer. We know from earlier on, um, it was a bit of a um, Rafe was given a bit of a beating. Exactly. Right? And so it's Corbaz moment, he's got all this pressure on him. Moments before that though, my favourite part is, is when uh, is when Rafe and his father, Helfek, uh, challenge Corban and it's when all of Corban's friends stand oh, up for him. They all stand, you know, they all stand, they all part ways, and then they also, you know, show their support for Corban. People mm-hmm. like, you know, Camlin and you know Adan and all, all, yeah. all other characters are coming into play and show that Corb, you know, the strength that Corbin has around him because of his character. I remember Pop Gwyn saying um, that he felt inspired by the moment in Harry Potter when um, I think it's in the final Deathly Hallows, like the Deathly Hallows Part Two, when um, they say that if Harry Potter is turned over, then. Um, that person be rewarded mm. and then I think Ginny stands in, oh Professor McGonagall stands in front of Harry and then yeah. all the others go over and it's a bit like that moment where you see Camden's holding onto his bow Pendatherin as well Hallion mm. all these people obviously Thanon, Gwyneth Dath, Farrell all of them it's just so so awesome and then even better Corbin just annihilates Ray. Yeah, it's like going like a it's paragraph so satisfying yeah. yeah it just shows the skill level that Corbin has obviously learning from Gar as well as Hallion he's mm-hmm. got these kind of two different different ways of learning his craft of different mentors yeah definitely number seven then is another Another one with Corban, it's the power of words. Yeah, very different to the reality of what actually happened. So Thanon finds out that Corban's being bullied by Rafe and he's lying. Yes, so he's very disappointed in Corban, but then he also says, Here is a lesson, I'm going to teach you the power of words. Let's go have a chat. And let's have a, let's have a chat with Helfech and, and Rafe. Yeah, with Rafe and his father, Helfech. And so um, he goes to Evans's hold and uh, it gar joins in along the way. Because Corban says, you know, Dar, Thanon is going to teach me the power of words and Gar's like, I don't think Thanon is the right really? man. <laughs> yeah, uh, because Thanon is not known for being calm. Mm-hmm. Uh, but anyway, you're, think- you're thinking at this moment he's going to teach a lesson to his son, he's going to be kind of this role model. And then Hellfetch says something and um, it ends up in a huge brawl, basically, where Thanon is attacking Hellfetch and then the Bud Eye is fa- fighting Hellfetch's hound and it's just this massive scrap, which Thanon comes on top of but um, Corban says oh well there's the power of words then and Gar it's the first time mm-hmm. Gar really laughs basically yeah, yeah definitely I absolutely love that scene and it is it's the first time you see Gar actually laughing and it is it, you also see how how Thanon will fight for his son as well and also how easily his temper uh, is boiled Snapped. over so yeah. I the love that fuse. Corban the just doesn't fuse. know what to think he has no idea really what the power of words is um, more like the power of Thanon's fists. Um, and then the next one, number five, is... Sorry, number six, is the naming of S.H.I.E.L.D. Another moment with Corban. You can see who our favourite characters are. So the naming of S.H.I.E.L.D. is a monumental scene. Uh, yeah, it is awesome because you're thinking, you know that if Storm kills uh, Hellfetch and Rafe's Hound, then she's going to be chucked out. Um, Corban won't be allowed to keep her. But then... So you, you want her to come and save Corban, but then you're thinking, but she does, there's going to be terrible consequences, and then S.H.I.E.L.D. just comes out of nowhere. I know this name, S.H.I.E.L.D., is unnamed, and I absolutely love how Papa Gwyn uses kind of key integral aspects of these special moments mm-hmm. to name the animals, yeah. uh, such as Storm. It's on a stormy night, and also... And you will also see... It's quite metaphorical as well, because it's the storm of change, mm-hmm. or kind of this meeting of alone, it's kind of very big in um, kind of... Corbin's ascension into more adulthood and maturity, isn't it? And so it's kind of that storm in that sense. And also with S.H.I.E.L.D., also S.H.I.E.L.D. is obviously protecting Corbin, and that's where the name comes from. And you also see this crop up in the prophecy as well that Makal tells um, at the, the gathering of the kings and the lords and their, um, and their counsellors, where, you know, the prophecy talking about uh, uh, the Chosen One, the Bright Star, the Seren Glare, not the Seven Disgraces, has... Um, has you know yeah you've got true heart you've got the yeah, has a storm and shield by their side and it's moments like that where you're like where you see you know Papa Gwen and what's you know all the strings being pulled together and I love how it's seeded there earlier on and um, yeah you know there's again so much tension that's what I love what Papa Gwen does he makes you so tense because you know 
the consequences of if Storm saves Corban by fighting, you know, by by saving him through, you know, physical means, then she will be put to death because that was, you know, Queen Alona's oath as well. So you can see the consequences that will happen and that makes you scared and worried. It really does. The next one then is Tull versus Morkant number one. 1.0. Um, and this is awesome. This is where the, a few of the kingdoms are meeting up to see if the moon is eclipsed. Yeah. Basically, see if this prophecy is real. And then all, some conflict takes over as Rin. Um, uh, Rin, and, aka Helen Mirren. Um, I think. She is a bit of a, a, some, a conflict to pick with Brennan. And it's settled in a duel between the two champions, Tull and Morkant. Tull, the older warrior, is a bit slower than he used to be, but he's still a champ, isn't he? And then Morkant, the yeah. younger warrior, cocky, annoying, nasty little piece of work, but an amazing, <laughs> amazing warrior. If you've seen the film Rob Roy, then that's what Will and I think of when, you know, Tull, definitely Liam Neeson, and uh, Morkant, definitely Tim Roth in that Archibald. film, uh, Archibald Cunningham. Uh, amazing, amazing film, and that duel is fantastic because you can see, you know, show you, swordsmen. Um, there's a very lots of different types of swordsmen. You know, they can be big and strong and powerful, but they can also be cunning. And being the cunning, mental side, being cunning is the most important aspect of it. So Tull oh, does reason. does win through uh, uh, through flicking sand in Morkan's iron. You know, it's fight dirty, but you fight dirty and you and you. But win. he fights well. Was... Yeah, exactly. So there we go, that is an awesome moment. And Tull is probably my favourite side character. Any time, yeah, he's awesome. Any time I see Morkan in pain, you know, I'm really happy. I'm happy, well. yeah. I'm being disgraced. Joyce. He is a bastard, in the words of Sharp, isn't he? Yes. <laughs> he is. And the next one is obviously number four. This, this scene, I'm sure you knew, was going to crop up. When Corban saves Storm. Oh, what a scene where kind of Corban is kind of this hunt which is being built up so much. And then that kind of earlier thread of Storm saving the Wolven. Um, and Corban saving the Wolven. Who did I say? Storm. Sorry. Corban. Storm she wasn't born yet. Yeah, um, Corban saving who we come to see is Storm's mother. Yeah. And that's awesome. And then <coughs> as he meets them all, and then Farrell was there as well, wasn't he? And then suddenly all the other riders yeah. sweep in and then this big fight with the pack of Wolven. And then there's some pups and Von is thrown off his horse, isn't he? And Evanus thinks he might die. And so he's pretty angry. He's raging at the time. So he commits a despicable deed and tramples these wolven pups but one survives and Corban just has the instinct to pick this pup up and it's so much of what we love about Corban kind of that loving instinct and being different from those around him being able to stand up for the weak even though it's an animal is kind of exactly what he stands for isn't yeah. it and what he comes to represent throughout this whole series and Storm becomes such an integral part of the story and I love how this story begins between the two of them. And I love the way that Papa Gwyn has all these, you know, these minor character moments from Corban, some are quite major as well, but you add them all up at the end of the book, at the end of the series, and you see um, how Corban is his, home, is his own person, definitely, and how you see that he sticks by his guns, he's got, you know, morals, and he will always stand by them. He backs himself. And I just love that it's a little bit like what David Gemmell does with Conovar in Sword and the Storm. He does all of these minor things that just show what a kind person, you know, a kind of considerate and compassionate person they are. And that, that's what make a makes a character easy to stand behind, definitely. On to the next one. Yes, let's do it. On to the next one then is the Drake charge. Or oh, so Shechem. Drakes think Komodo dragons on steroids with really sharp claws. No, so really sharp compared to what they've got already. Yeah, super sharp. Yeah. Super sharp. Yeah. Really, really. And so they're, they're massive as well. They've got giants on them as well. Yeah. So it's pretty terrifying. And this is the first time that we're seeing the shield wall in proper use. There's a little demo that King Aquilus watches um, as Nathair kind of hosts that. But this is the first one in actual conflict, actual war, actual consequences if it works or mm -hmm. does not work. And Nathair describes to Varelis that um, it'll be the hammer and the anvil. Mm -hmm. And uh, Varelis will be the hammer. He will be the hammer that strikes. And um, Nathair is flanking them it was Nefer's the... first campaign isn't it yes. and he is you know he's trying he's a prince he's trying to become uh, he's trying to leave his father's shadow really which he is really pinned down by and it is kind of a, a complex of his um, that he is struggling with mentally and emotionally as well and this is his first chance to really prove himself he's got this new tactics which um, is using a shield wall which goes against everyone in the banished lands what they you know what they stand for in terms of honor where you're not really fighting honorably you're fighting as a unit as a co cohesive unit but think you know the roman army versus the celts the celts would fight single you know would basically duel 
each other on the battlefield. Um, they'd ha- and then, but the Romans came along, they fought as a unit, and that's how they were able to defeat so many people because they fought as, you know, as a collective bunch of people, really. And you were is, trained well. Yeah. And this is the first time that Shield Wars has been in play, and no less. It's a pretty against, hard test. It, it's a hard test because it's against massive, massive reptiles that are basically dinosaurs with giants riding on them with great big war hammers and axes and all sorts. I love that you feel the fear and you see that Papa, how Papa Gwyn really does write a fantastic battle scene. And, you know, history's amazing, but what's great about fantasy battle scenes, you can have these amazing creatures uh, such as Drake, you can have giants, and you can have it feel so cinematic. And I think that's what Papa Gwyn Dada does best. It's absolutely phenomenal. Uh, and I love the way the variety, you know, the fear is, is played into that. And then the Thayer's charge as well really does finish off the Drakes uh, and the Shechem riding them. And it's just an amazing sequence, really. It really is. Yeah. And the next one, then number two, is approaching the end of Malice after Corban and, and Wraith have dueled. It's Gar versus the Eagle Guard. Now, the Eagle Guard and the Thayer's uh, chosen warriors, like basically his Praetorian Guard um, and yeah. whatnot, if you know any of your Roman history. And yeah. Gar, you think he's an injured warrior, you know. But you know then, there's a bit more to him, but you exactly. don't expect this. Thanon has just been killed by the Eagle God, and we know what what a warrior Thanon is. Yeah. And then Gar just annihilates. And obviously, Gar is kind of an almost father figure for Corban while Thanon is still alive. You know, he's just uh, this other manly presence that Corban can go to for advice, and uh, and he does act. You know, he is very good. For, Gar is great friends with Thanon and Gwyneth. Corban's mum and you can see how much Gar means to Corban so he's fearing he's going to lose basically another father figure when Gar goes up against the Eagle Guard and all of a sudden he destroys the Eagle Guard but but also we're conflicted because we know one of them is Ralka and we really like Ralka and so this is where I think Papa Quinn does great having good and bad people well obviously more complicated than that yeah. but people you like and people you dislike on both, both sides so then it's never going to be an utter victory and there's, it's always going to be a win-loss situation isn't yeah, it yeah. And, and Gar pulls out this chinkashkuk move from Last Mohicans he where he rolls under his blade and I love little intricacies like that and you can see the inspiration as well from Papa Gwyn's writing and it's just a mouth-watering scene where your heart is is probably coming out of the nostrils. And then what comes out next, not only is it unveiled that Gar's an amazing warrior, it's unveiled that he knows Samur, and they have this amazing deal, and it seems like Gar may have a bit of the upper hand, Mm -hmm. and then he steps near to Thanon's body, and Bud Eye bites him, and he's defending his owner's body. Mm -hmm. So sad. And anything with the dog upset him, it will make me cry. So I probably, I actually couldn't read the last few chapters of Malice, just because I destroyed the book so much, yeah. Um, And then we're going to do some historical... Mention no. historical, not historical mentions, honourable mentions, honorable because mentions. we like to cheat. Okay, um, so we're going to get another three. Um, I keep going to say historical, honourable mentions here. So number one is when after Corban has banished Storm, um, you know he's hit her with a stick. He's trying to save her after she's attacked Ray. Mm. Sorry about that. Ed. Karen talking. Oh dear, Will. You okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm just a little bit tired from the nap. No, I'm all right. Sure. I'm enjoying this. I'm You're enjoying, enjoying it. it. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't know why. I'm I happy. yawn when I'm having fun too. Um, and Storm has been away from Corban for a few moons, really, a few months. And Corban is, you know, heartbroken. He cries into his pillow every night because he misses Storm. She's being hunted by Evnis and his men as well. So the fear is there that Storm's going to get captured and killed as well. They're going to return wearing a, a wolven pelt, which would break Corban even more. But then they're finally reunited. Corban knows that Storm is following him uh, and he goes into the forest and Gar is following him to try and look after him because he's always his, at his shoulder, his shadow presence, isn't he? Um, and then, you know, it's like that little puppy moment where you go, you see your puppy, you walk into your house and yet your puppy hasn't seen you for an hour and they're just the most excited they could ever be. And then, and then that you know, magnified, obviously, by the time difference and the tension filled mm-hmm. in between. Yeah, definitely, and it's it's a heartbreaking moment. Where, you, but you know, it's heartwarming as well. Where you, I really cried when Storm was reunited. Because we said anything with a dog or wolf or anything yeah. that anything resembles that has fur, I will cry. <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah, an amazing moment. The next honourable mention then is when Caladus reveals himself uh, as a Ben Elim, so at as, as basically an angel, really at Telasar, showing that Nathair has a Ben Elim, someone so revered and mythical on his side. 
and it's a very key moment. Isn't it, it really is. It's very, very powerful because, of course, we know that Nefer is kind of confiding in Caladus, but there's still an element of trust, well, distrust, and uh, should that trust be given? And then at this very powerful moment where it looks like their expedition into kind of Telesar in Tarbesh is going to be just forgotten um, and kind of been for nothing in vain, then Caladus just pulls this out of the bag and then um, it's a huge revelation in Malice. Yeah. And then and also, even better on a reread. Yeah, even better on a reread because you Those see you know, what happens. Yeah. You know. If you know, you know. And the last honourable mention is how can we not have uh, in these key moments without mentioning the awesome Camlin, excuse me, so it's when Braith, the fearsome Darkwood bandit and rebel, um, it rescues Camlin from imprisonment in Dunkarig. Yes, and then it's not just about kind of that kind of element because you've got um, you've got Camlin and then Marek, who we love, he's a great character, and then you've got Braith meeting him for the first time, and I love how Papa Quinn kind of builds up this character who's mentioned quite a lot. Quite a lot killing Queen Alona's brother, yeah. Rhaegar, and so there's this huge kind of building up. And then also there's Corban and Kaiwen just appear with Storm as well. And so it's a lot about the strength of uh, personality of Kaiwen and Corban and their response to this dire situation where Marek is taken as a hostage because it also shows Cameron, whilst he has done terrible things, he is at his core good because mm -hmm. he won't let Cameron just let uh, Marek just be killed yeah. for nothing. And or he won't, Corban and he won't let Corban and Kaiwen be be killed either yeah. and so yeah it shows that he will stand up to Braith and Braith is a very powerful figure he really jumps off the page straight away and yeah great scene really powerful and I love how it kind of spells a lot of the story to come with Cor um, Camden and Corban and Kaiwen. So when I first read Malice which is called So Deep in Malice when I read it um, my favourite character was always Camden. Camden was always my favourite character I absolutely love his growth I love him as a person I always liked that type of character um, you know, kind of a redemption arc as well, where they almost don't deserve it, but then, you know, they re you really do sympathise with them the more you find out about them. Um, and yeah, I always love reading Camden's point of view. I think his perspective is very unique. Um, and he's always kind of at war with himself, isn't he? Which I really absolutely love. And in that scene, you can see his goodness. And then the final mention of us that we're going to talk so about. So not, not an honourable mention. No, this, this is the number, number one, one our favourite moment from Malice Book One. And it feels a bit them. twisted saying it's our favourite, but it's because it's so yeah, powerful it's and it's him, this is the one that made me cry the most. This is the most heart-thumping one and it is Tull's last stand and uh, the chase um, in in the forest of Narbon. Yes, yeah, so this is about kind of that, um, the ambush of Queen Lona, Dana and Kaiwen, and then Rowan is there as well. And then they're told to flee whilst Tull holds off this ambush of a few others. And then there's the revelation that it's Morkant, um, and it's not really the warriors of Narbon um, ambushing them. And then Camden is watching, and as Kaiwen is escaping, well, escaping for a little while, um, Tull, <laughs> one warrior charges forward, Tull kills them, kills another, and he's suddenly the final one standing. Um, and he shouts, who's next? And that is just absolutely awesome. Yeah. Um, and then Morkan steps forward and the little coward gets Braith to shoot Morkan. Yeah. And then even though Camden is like, he doesn't want Braith to die and he's on the side of the ambushers, he's, he know, it's a bitter, leaves a bitter taste in his mouth that this is how a great warrior like Tull went. And you love Tull, he's a brilliant character. I love his little interactions with Corban and all the moments that he has, which are just iconic. He's one of those characters that he's not in too much of the book. He's probably in present in four or five of the chapters as yeah. he has a major role. Um, but in those, he really leaves off the page and really leaves a, a, leaves a um, an imprint on the mind, doesn't he? Yeah, he does big time. And I love the way that you got two POVs writing about, you know, talking about this, um, this little section just to start with, with Cohen escaping. And then you've got Camlin picking up the pieces at the end as well. And you don't really know who more can is at the moment they call him Scar um, and, but then Camden kind of works out that Scar aka Morkan and Tull have and the, why the is history he it's because he's got the scar from that talk Tull left him earlier on so yeah it's a great moment and I love that whole sequence where um, Queen Alona and Cohen and Adana and then Ronan as well is captured uh, where well, Ronan's killed isn't he and Cohen's going through that grief and then Gar and Corba meet up with Connell and Hallium and a few of the other warriors of uh, Dunkarig uh, of um, Ardan and then they use Storm to help find Queen Alona and Cohen and it's just a fantastic segment really where 
you know, you're, you, you've kind of got this hope that Corbett is now reunited with Storm, that she can kind of redeem herself. And you, you've also got the fear that something's going to happen to Cohen. And then Camelin is standing up to Morcan. Just an amazing, amazing sequence there that really took our breath away. It really is. And there is our top 10 favourite moments of Malice alongside some honourable mentions. Hard to mention, only 13. I know, it really is, isn't it? There's a few that I'm really sad weren't mentioned. But mm. please do let us know your favourite moments of Malice. It doesn't have to be all 10 because that's yeah. a lot to type out. But let us know some of your favourite favorite moments let us know if you'd like to see more videos like this we do plan to do a top 10 for each book with the faith from the fallen and yeah so there we go hopefully you enjoy us talking about some of papa quinn's works let us know any other chats related to the faith and fallen or blood and bone the blood sworn you would like to see on the channel thank you very much for watching everyone truth and courage the brothers Gwyn. truth and courage the brothers Gwyn.